So good morning, everybody. My name is Kai Polstra. I'm from the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies. Please let me greet you as a vice president of the International Astroinformatics Association. So already in 2016, we organized an IU symposium on astroinformatics. It was Symposium 325. It was in Sorrento, Italy. And now it's a great pleasure to welcome you for the second day and for the plenary session of the IEU Symposium 368, Machine Learning in Astronomy. The morning speaker and the first speaker of today is George Jogowski. Unfortunately, his Wi-Fi connection is a little bit unstable, therefore we will play a pre-recorded talk. George is available online and he will be there to answer questions. George is professor of astronomy and data science. He is also director of the Center of Data Driven Discoveries at Caltech. He has done so many things that I had to take some notes, not to forget anything about that. And please, George, forgive me, I probably will. So he is involved in the something like 600 scientific papers. His scientific interest is very, very broad, so I try to summarize it with the most important things I can memorize. So he is working on very distant galaxies, fundamental properties of nearby galaxies, globular clusters. He's working on gamma ray bears and their host galaxies, gravitational lenses, binary quasars, and of course, exploration of the time domain. Already early 1990, he switched to the field of big data astronomy, especially knowledge discovery tools. And he is known as a PI or co-PI for DPOS, the Palomar Quest, and the Catalina Real-Time Transient Survey. He is co-founder of the Virtual Observatory, and he is also co-founder of Astroman Informatics and one of the starters of Time Domain Astronomy. So without further taking your time, even though it's from a video, I would leave the stage to George Sargowski. Please give a big round of applause for George. With you in person. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge and thank my long-term collaborators, Ashish Mahabal and Matthew Graham, who, along with many others, really deserve credit for everything that we've done and everything that's correct in this talk. And I'll take the blame for everything else. So I've been asked to give an overview of machine learning in astronomy, which is impossible. It is a very big subject, very vibrant subject, and so all I can do is just give you a quick, uh, highly incomplete and probably biased overview. So as you probably know, astronomy has been undergoing an exponential data growth since at least early 1990s, which was largely driven by the advent of large digital sky surveys. And as the data volume kept increasing, the needs of data analysis changed. Once we got into the terascale tera data sets and billions of sources detected, it was clear that traditional ways of analyzing the data are, are insufficient, and that's where machine learning started coming in. Astronomers have been very um, advanced and proactive relative to many other fields in introducing all of these data science innovations, although today biological sciences are really in the lead. But today we're roughly in an exabyte regime. That's my best guess estimate of how much data there is in astronomical archives that's actually properly archived and documented. That's probably good to factors of two or three. And the exponential growth continues. What's more interesting is the growth of data quality, data complexity, and information content. And that's really why we need machine learning. So mostly I will be talking about use, machine, use of machine learning to explore feature spaces or parameter spaces that are created, say, by measuring number of different things in catalogs. We do image segmentation, 
then every object is represented as a set of describing parameters. And there are many challenges involving that, um, which are listed here. I'll talk a little more about them later. There are literally hundreds of different machine learning models, as computer scientists call them, in anal analyzing the data, depending on what is it that you're trying to do. So I took a quick look at the literature at the ADS. I asked about papers that has either machine learning or AI in their title or abstract, and the results shown here. Uh, prior to about 2005 or so, it was like few papers per year. But starting circa 2012, it assumed an exponential growth with a doubling time of about 20 months, close enough to Moore's law, and that continues as far as I can tell. Then I realized that papers that use deep learning don't mention machine learning, just deep learning. So I counted those, and those are the solid dots that you can see here. And obviously, that really erupted in use since 2016, and now it's asymptotically the same kind of exponential. So all in all, I would say there are now at least 3,000 papers in the astronomical literature that use machine learning. This is very much an established blooming field, and the variety of uses is really impressive. By the way, if I don't mention your work, which I'm sure is great, that's because I couldn't really read 3,000 papers, but um, maybe other speakers of this conference will feel, feel some of the gaps that they leave. And it's becoming easier to do with all of these online libraries and tools like uh, PyTorch, TensorFlow, SkyKit, and so on. On the other hand, this uh, XKCD cartoon does hit the home that there are some papers that really consist of steering a big pile of um, linear algebra and looking for the results that look right. Fortunately, they're in minority. Most of the work, as far as I can tell, is a very high quality. So to start from the beginning, uh, whereas there were some small scale looks into the things like neural networks, it really started with the first digital sky surveys in the early 1990s. And the first task that came about was star galaxy separation. Because for most scientific purposes, you either need galaxies or stars or star-like objects. And so really it's the depth, limiting depth of classification that defines utility of a survey, not so much the limiting depth of detection. And a number of different things have been tried, mostly neural networks and decision trees. Um, some simple examples are shown here. But notice that those early uses of machine learning in astronomical data analysis were really to outsource highly repetitive not necessarily complex, but kind of boring tasks away from humans to machines. And that essentially became part of the pipeline, which was obviously very uh, useful and important. I can't resist by mentioning that even in a, that in addition to these supervised classification tools, we did even try looking into unsupervised clustering in the spirit of data science to let the data tell you what's in the data and just asking a question how many different kinds of things are in my data just feeding in parameters from source catalogs using this program called autoclass uh, we found out that well, it thought that there are four different kinds of things in our data stars and stars with little fuzz around them it could be agns or something like that galaxies and then diffuse galaxies now there was no obviously no interesting new science here, but it was a start. We couldn't push this much further because we were, like, first of all, we're lacking the right kind of data, but also lacking the proper computer power. And now we're finally getting in a stage where this kind of holy grail of systematic exploration of the sky can be done. So in addition to star galaxy separation, the other major early use of uh, machine learning was in photometric redshifts. Now, as you know, uh, spectroscopy is really expensive observationally, and so if you can produce at least reasonably accurate redshifts for faint galaxies or quasars from the photometry alone, that maps into great saving of observing time. 
And many, many groups have worked on this. Many different tools have been tried, um, by and large, fairly successfully. I would point out that one major insight was that photometric redshifts shouldn't be thought of as numbers with some error bar attached to them, but rather they're each representing a probability density distribution, which could be very complex, not a simple Gaussian. So the error bars are ill-defined, and one has to really do a much more careful analysis when using them, say, to probe galaxy clustering and so on. So aside from that, the other application in doing actual science from the data in catalogs that have been properly cleaned and classified and so on was selecting interesting targets for follow-up observations, usually spectroscopy. What's shown here is a diagram from two-dimensional color space in Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The contours represent where the stellar locus is in this diagram. And the color dots are quasars with redshift encoded as a color here. So that really became a major principle of survey-driven astronomy that you map the sky to some extent into a survey archive. And then you mine the survey archive, you essentially observe it with a software instrument that usually involves machine learning to select potentially interesting things to follow up, depending on what your scientific goals are. And um, nowadays, this is seen as a normal thing, a synergy of telescopes. You have surveys, usually done some smaller telescopes, you select interesting things to study, you follow them up with big telescopes or space observatories. But that was a new thing in late, late 1990s. Up until then, people were just doing targeted observing uh, individual objects, small samples, and surveys were not seen as a respectable thing to do, but now they very much are. So this notion of machine learning or software instruments to observe data archives I think is a crucial change. So typically that included, that was done for kinds of objects we know that were rare, but would have well-defined observable characteristics like spectra, and you fold them through the filters and so on. And so you have an empirical model of where should they be in your parameter space. And so, for example, quasars, brown dwarfs, or what have you. And then you just look for any objects that are outliers from the bulk of objects, which are, say, the stellar locus here, and take their spectra. And that works beautifully. In fact, almost all quasars now known have essentially used this approach. But sometimes things that you didn't think about have the same observational signature in your parameter space or color space. And what's shown here on the lower left is a an example of a highly peculiar broad absorption line quasar. It was only like one or two known by, at that time. And those are not noise peaks. Those are all real thing, real absorption features. Um, so more were found since then. And that's also an example of how these searches, which are really model-driven, empirical or supervised classification-driven, can actually find things that are not initially expected, uh, but are not necessarily new in a fundamental sense. This is just a particularly peculiar, rare subtype of a subtype of quasars. And the same thing pretty much happened ever since. Um, even though we always hoped that these large surveys would uncover things that we never knew existed before, that hasn't really happened we found a lot of subtypes of variations of the kinds of things we know, like supernovae, there are now many different varieties, um, quasars or what have you, but never something was like a completely new thing. The only really fundamentally new thing I think was found recently were fast radio bursts, but that's a whole another story. Nevertheless, this hope that we can somehow explore the sky in an unbiased fashion and find things that we didn't know about before persisted. And that's essentially the outlier or anomaly search. Now, that is not a well-defined problem. So suppose you have some feature space, you've made decisions which features to look at, and 
their clusters, stars, galaxies, quasars, whatever. Uh, and then you look for objects that are kind of standing away in statistically significant sense from the clouds of normal looking things. Well, that begs the question, what exactly is an outlayer? And the key question is, well, what is the probability density distribution of common type of objects? So are you looking at genuine outlier or is it just a fat tail of the distribution? Because in real life, things are seldom Gaussian. It also depends on things like the metric that you choose and so on and so forth. So there's nothing you can do about this, but you, you can actually try to be very careful in looking at probability density distributions of your clusters and does guiding your judgment of which things should be legitimately considered as outlier. Because if the tails are not Gaussian, but maybe parallel exponential, something that you might think is five sigma, if it was a Gaussian, maybe only like two sigma outlier. Well, circa the turn of the millennium, um, time domain astronomy really begun. The detectors became cheaper, easier, could pave the focal planes with them. And so instead of doing panoramic cosmic photography, we started doing panoramic cosmic cinematography. And that opened this whole time domain because there is unique information that's available through variability that cannot be obtained in any other way. And sometimes it's the only way you can make sense of things like single picture of a supernova tells you exactly nothing. Um, well, the problem there is there are a lot of things that vary in the sky and a lot of things that bang in the night. Um, and they all look the same. They all look like a star that was now brighter than it used to be, or maybe there wasn't one detected before. And that's all you know about it, and you know where it is in the sky. Well, but the problem is that there are many, many different kinds of objects that have that same signature. There are a few hundred varieties of variable stars alone. There are all kinds of cosmic explosions, AGNs, and so on. And so some of those things that are showing strong variability are a lot more interesting than others, depending, again, what your goals are. And so how do you tell? So instead of the old-fashioned morphological classification of images, we now have to deal with the physical classification of objects that have been picked up as anomalies in the time domain space. And some of them are really exciting. Some of them will disappear quickly. So you have to do this pretty much in real time to catch them and get spectra before it's too late. And all other information you have is um, from archives, multi-wavelength observations or uh, looking for a temporal uh, context or spatial context. Where is it? If it's superposed on a, on a galaxy that, that has some information, if it's not, well, then you don't really know. And Turns, that's all very heterogeneous because for any given ver variable or transient, until you build up gigantic uh, data set, including the time axis, the data are very heterogeneous and incomplete. If something is what we call a transient, you maybe only have a couple of data points in it, like curve, so you can classify that. And that's where all the difficulties come from. So many groups have been working on this for about 20 years now and with various degrees of success, some parts of this problem have been solved. You can, for example, find supernovae of type 1A if you want uh, with a reasonably good accuracy. But usually successful or highly productive ways of finding something are ignoring everything else. And so there is, there is a balance to be struck there. So I will not be talking about various attempts to classify things, but I will just mention a couple of things. The first one was to realize that we can turn this highly heterogeneous collection of oddly spaced measurements into homogeneous data that can be fed to machine learning. So instead of using actual data, flux measurements as a function of time, we represent every one of those light curves as a set of statistical descriptors. And there are about 70 of those that have been really tried or proven to be even moderately useful. And now what used to be heterogeneous collection of light curves, some of which may have 10 points, some hundred, some thousand, is now a homogeneous set of feature vectors with 
every particular value in that vector field may, or may not be significant. And that is something you can feed into the traditional machine learning tools. So it will work on the, on the data descriptors and not the data themselves. Well, but that's still a lot of different parameters. And one of the biggest challenges in data science and machine learning is dimensionality reduction. Most algorithms don't scale very well with increased number of data dimensions at all. And it's also very hard to visualize things in more than 3D, and I'll talk a little more about that later. So does the dimensionality reduction um, feature selection to do dimensionality reduction becomes crucial. There are many different methods to do this, and um, I can't possibly go through all of them. I'll just mention a couple that seem to be very popular. Uh, but before I do that, here is an example of what feature selection can do for you. In the top left, you see two light curves of two variable stars. One is pulsating variable, the other one is uh, eclipsing binary. And you can't even tell that they're periodic, let alone something else, let alone that they're different. But if you do proper feature selection, shown histogram in the lower left, and just take the top three, suddenly the two clouds of points separate beautifully. And so what was, what looked like a hopeless task at first becomes fairly easy. Now, this is maybe an unusually uh, fortunate case, but that's the idea. All right, so one of the methods that's commonly used for dimensionality reduction is principal component analysis, which is dear to my heart as a means of finding multivariate correlations. And the idea here is that there is data distribution in some parameter space, and you compute what are the eigenvectors of the distribution and their eigenvalues, meaning how significant they are along that axis. And so then a lot of then a lot of the, the a lot, a lot of measurements are simply not very useful at all. But PCA tells you which ones seem to really contain most of the variance seen in the sample. And you just take top few that look significant, and voila, you map the original parameter space into highly dimensionality reduced space, new coordinates without really doing anything else. That works in some cases, but ultimately PCA really works best if you're dealing with the monolithic data cloud, which is ideally multivariate Gaussian and in real life, nothing really is. So if you have say strong clustering, that makes computation of principal axes a little ambiguous, or if you have strong outlayers and so on. So there are situations in which this helps, and there are situations in which PCA will just give you totally misleading approach. Another uh, fashionable thing is TISNI, which is used all over in different data science, which is an example of latent space models. They essentially map your high dimensionality original feature space into a lower dimensionality latent space that's found through machine learning, typically 2D. And in this particular case, you do a very nice separation of different clusters in the data, at least on scales compared to the proximity scale that's built in called perplexity. But unfortunately, those latent space dimensions usually don't have a very clean cut understanding or identification of what are they. Um, and also the distances that are larger than perplexity parameter are meaningless, which is sometimes irrelevant, but sometimes you really like to know how far it clusters apart. So Disney works for some purposes, but again, not for everything, but at least makes colorful pictures like this. Then, as I mentioned earlier, circa 2016, the whole deep learning revolution really kicked in. And there are now hundreds and hundreds, maybe probably more than a thousand papers now that use deep learning in astronomy some way or another. I'll only mention a couple of examples here. Uh, both of them are from Zwicky Transit Facility, and Dima Duev and Ashish Mahabal were the leaders of that effort. This one, the first one is in time domain survey, if you're doing image subtraction to see what's new, well, 
there are often many artifacts and you want to separate real from bogus transients. And usually that was done in the past with supervised uh, classifiers, but now with uh, convolutional networks, they can really do an excellent job going from just working directly in the pixel space and not having to actually characterize objects through whatever image property by our parameters. Another one is looking for fast moving objects, typically asteroids, some of which are probably near Earth asteroids, potential planetary hazard asteroids, and finding streaks because they move during the exposure and separating real streaks from variety of artifacts that can come in. And so that also was done through um, deep learning networks, again, work by Dueb and Mahabal and, and collaborators. And since Ashish is there, he can tell you a lot more about it. He understands it much better than I do. Now, there's been a lot of work on just mining archival time domain light curves, time sequences of flux measurements. And there are many different aspects to this, but one is looking for periodic signals. And so let me say a few things about that because that's one science example I'd like to elaborate on a little bit. In the olden days, people would measure fluxes, look for things that go up and down repeatedly, great periodic source. In late 20th century, uh, a new method came in, periodograms, thanks to Lamb and Scargill, which are essentially discrete Fourier transforms applied to unevenly spaced data. And you get autocorrelation function of power spectrum, and you look for peaks. If there, there is periodic signal, then there'll be a peak in this power spectrum. And, and also there'll be its harmonics. And by and large, it works, but there are some assumptions built in, such as how exactly do you judge the significance of this, these peaks? Because by and large, things are not white noise or Gaussian noise. And if you have a periodic signal superposed on a more complex kind of noise, the correlated noise, red noise, then you need to worry about things. Now, we are doing something that's much more complex. We have to model the whole process as combination of stochastic process that's modeled and any uh, variability top of it or periodic variability if need be. And so let me give you a simple example. Here is the work that's led by Matthew Graham. Um, there's a quasar light curve, shows waves. Everybody knows they have red noise. Sometimes it looks like periodic signal, but it really isn't. Um, and how do you actually tell? Well, if you just do traditional periodogram approach, that's shown on the right, things don't look very good, very noisy. Fortunately, there is a thing called the Z-transform that, that produces autocorrelation function that is much cleaner. And in the panel in the middle, the dashed red lines is an exponential. Uh, if you have damped random walk, pure damped random walk, which is what most of these things are kind of like, ACF will be exponential. And if there is any periodic signal, there'll be a peak. Um, and it's a broad peak if you don't have much of a baseline. And so that's exactly what you can see here. So you have to do a lot of modeling, you have to use exact, well, the right kind of stochastic process descriptions, and a lot of, a lot of Monte Carlo with sampling just like your real data and signal to noise and so on. And then play with parameters until you suppress the number of false alarms uh, sufficiently. So we've done this using quasar light curves from CRTS, and we found candidates for periodically variable quasars. The first one, strongest one then, was this one, PG-1302. And we worked with our data. We added archival data from Linear and others and kept monitoring it and kept doing the same thing uh, as we expected from originally detected periodicity. This is actually something that was expected um, from what we know about hierarchical structure formation. Galaxies in their supermassive black holes will merge. 
black holes would merge to build bigger supermassive black holes in the final stages of that there are tight binary that loses orbital kinetic energy to gravitational waves spirals in that's it. so things like that have to be out there the problem is they're if they're closer than a parsec they're totally unresolvable by any technology today or in any predictable future and so the only th hope you have is if at least one of the two black holes has an accretion disk, so there is some light that you can measure, or radio waves, whatever, um, and the other black hole is perturbing it. It has to be another supermassive object, otherwise, who cares? You know, if one is dominated by 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole, then you better have something at least comparable to perturb it. And so looking for periodically modulated signal from accretion disks inside supermassive black hole binaries is basically the only way in which you can find these objects now. And maybe gravitational waves in them. So this is how this was interpreted. Uh, there was a great model produced by a Columbia group, Hyman and company. And we then looked more carefully at the data. We extended the search. We found about 100 candidates for periodically variable quasars. They're not necessarily really periodically variable quasars, but they're good candidates. And we continue to monitor them, including spectroscopy. Uh, so now we think maybe half of them will be really robust candidates, which just take years and years to see how weather cycles repeat. But some show also spectroscopic variations, and that's work that's still in progress. Now, this was challenged by many people, some of whom basically said, oh, but red noise can look like periodic noise. Yeah, we know that. And maybe those people should actually read our papers, especially the methodology section. And some people just had faulty statistical approach to it. Um, nevertheless, there's been a lot of good work or a lot of work at least and this would be a very interesting thing to continue because it's confirming one of the essential predictions of hierarchical structure formation what made me believe it is that we find the right number and the right distribution of periods theoretical models of those evolving populations of merging supermassive black holes uh, in the right redshift interval and so on suggest about 100 should be found and about 100 we did find. So roughly speaking, one in 10,000 quasars has this behavior in the period range that we probed up to five-ish years or so. And there is a cutoff at short period end, which is due to the in-spiral, because the closer they are, the faster they spiral in. And so you depopulate the short period end of the distribution, exactly as we see. On the long period side, it's just lack of data. We, we, we need decades of photometric monitoring to really fill that up. Most recently, there's been another case found in a completely different way by Tony Reedhead's group in radio. They've been monitoring 10,000 flat spectrum radio sources from Oberon, and they found one that had a nice sinusoidal variation over the past 14 or so years. They have about two and a half full cycles, just like we had for the PG-1302. Then archival data added one more cycle. Then there was a long period that wasn't really behaving periodically, the archival data. And then further down in the past, there are a couple of major peaks that aren't the right face. So this is, I would say, just as good candidate as any. Um, and it's great that it was found in a different way. I think basically just says, yes, those things are out there at about right numbers, one in 10,000 or so. And we have both the data and the means, analysis means to discover it. There are many, many other exciting uses of machine learning, and I can't possibly sample them at all, but several groups have worked on using it to discover gravitational lenses. And I'll just mention this one because it's, I'm involved in it. It is combining Gaia data with ground-based surveys effort led by Alberto Crum Martins and a large team of people supporting it, um, and uses three different methods to discover potential gravitational lenses, um, which I described here, but you should just really look at the papers to get more details. 
The upshot is that to date, we have spectroscopically confirmed about 20 new quad lenses. Those are the lenses that are actually useful for prismology, both for measurements of Hubble constant at the redshift range between local Cepheid scale and cosmic microwave background, and thus in principle could solve that major outstanding controversy, and also properties of dark matter in halos of the lensing objects. And in addition to those, several tens of doublet lenses, some of which are actually binary quasars, which are all interesting in their own right. All right, so I mentioned some challenges in the beginning, and the four most important ones in my mind are first visualizing high dimensionality data spaces, because two and three is easy, but what if you have 10, 100,000 dimensions of your feature space, you have to see what's going on. How do you do that? I think there's a promising approach that goes a little beyond from what you can do with traditional techniques, that's extended reality. There is a call explainable AI field, which is a booming field in computer science. How do you actually know why AI and machine learning is giving you the answers that it does? Neural networks, for example, are notoriously hard to interpret. Why do they do that? What they do? There is question of uncertainty, quantification. Um, say a few words about that. And of course, biases. So visualization, in my mind, is the stepchild of all data science um, because you really have to look at the data and machine learning models at every stage of the analysis, from planning to choosing the right algorithms, because if you don't choose the right algorithm, even best data can produce wrong results, to actually understanding the results and presenting them to other people so they can understand them. So there is a premium on trying to visualize as many dimensions of data space as possible. And for a number of years, we've been pushing use of extended reality as the approach to doing that. Um, because whenever you down project multi-dimensional space to say 2D, um, you lose some information. And that turns out to be actually very intuitive. It triggers human pattern recognition a lot better than any of traditional visualization tools. It's also collaboration friendly. And best of all, somebody else is paying for this technology because those are the technologies that will underline future 3D web, uh, which may or may not be actually called metaverse. The uncertainty quantification I'm illustrating here with an example from climate modeling, because that's a hell of a lot more important than anything astronomers do. But the point is that in addition to measurement errors and Poissonian errors and numerical, numerical errors, every decision you make, the choice of data, the choice of feature spaces, the choice of quantities you look at, the choice of algorithms, workflows, everything, in principle, introduces a component of uncertainty that's not accounted intrinsically. And there is not yet a truly formal framework for estimating the total uncertainty quantification. And a number of people are really working hard to figure that one out. And finally, the biases. Um, some people use machine learning as a black box, just like some people use statistics as a black box. And all kinds of things can go wrong. And at every stage of the process, you make decisions, which they to use, which to throw out, and how to clean them, which, which algorithms to use, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the point is that at every stage where humans make decisions, how do you compose your training data sample, for example, um, and so on, there is room for biases. And they're usually hard to, to catch. So you have to actually be very careful about whether you're building in assumptions that are really not warranted by the data. And I love the quote by Ivan King that's on the bottom that compares uh, misuse of statistics to the witches in Macbeth. Um, and just like statistics, a computer tells you strictly what's true, given the question you ask and the data you gave it and the interpretation is up to you. 
So one other thing is now using machine learning not to describe geometry of data space, like clusters, correlations, what have you, but to find analytical expressions that may be implied by the data. And the technique we played with is symbolic regression in this paper by Graham et al. More recently, Max Tegmark and collaborators have a series of excellent papers trying to do this. The goal is can we find new laws of physics or at least new interesting phenomenological correlations that we didn't know about before. So we tested this by trying to rediscover a main sequence of nature diagram, fundamental plane correlation, did fine. And then we used it as a classifier that the let program come up with a function or variables, you multiply by a step function such that on one side you type one, the other side is type two. Again, use the same example of these uh, periodic variables. The plot in the upper right is data the program has never seen and show you that it's actually found right clusters. And the table, which you obviously cannot read, compares the accuracy and, and uh, efficiency and purity of this approach to random forest. So it's doing fairly well for first attempt. So that finally leads me to progress in artificial intelligence. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the example of AlphaGo, and that's truly a spectacular success. But to me, the most interesting part was that program, which was only shown rules of the game, has come up with new strategies that humans never saw and that don't even understand. And that's exactly what we want from AI, to find things that humans cannot, for whatever reason. Now, the new version of this is AlphaFold, which is solve the protein folding problem. And this is probably the first time that AI has actually made real scientific discovery without being told what to do. Um, and now this is a major tool in gen genomics. So we're now heading more and more as there is amazing progress going on in AI into using AI as a collaborator. In AI, we have created an alien intelligence on planet Earth, and it thinks differently from us, it has different hardware, that's for sure, and different software. And it's the difference in way it thinks that is really important. It, it amplifies and extends what our minds can do. And at some point, it's going to be way too smart, and we will not be able to understand why it has discovered things that obviously are true. But then again, most people use technology without any understanding of how it works. So finally, let me end up with a few sociological comments. And I love this quote from Jean Grey, uh, technology is easy, people are really hard. And the problems come from the fact that we're dealing with technology that's evolving faster than any technology in history on scales of years. Whereas people learn and change maybe on scale of decades, if at all, an institution on scales of decades to centuries. Academia is notoriously inert in accepting new things. So first of all, the uptake is difficult because powerful older scientists don't necessarily understand why this is important. And then we do not teach all these skills in the regular university classes. I'm not talking computer science, which is way too detailed, but you know something for practicing astronomers. Fortunately, there is a lot of excellent material online. I bet that most of you have learned your machine learning not in traditional classes but on your own in some way and the this part of, prof of profession is not yet respected as much as it should be and so smart young people who learn these skills do the smart thing and move on into the commercial world where they can apply their new skills to equally complex and interesting challenging problems and actually be paid proper salaries so academia's loss is society's gain. And I'll end up with a recap of what I told you that machine learning is now completely standard part of the astronomical analysis toolkit. It's essential, necessary because of the growing size and complexity of data sets. 
the challenges we have are the same challenges everybody else has. And so it's good to talk to colleagues in other disciplines, say bioinformatics or geoinformatics. But the way we use machine learning has changed. First, from just outsourcing repetitive menial tasks to actually finding highly non-trivial things in complex data, and now entering into a new era where human minds can be collaborating with AIs in making the discoveries. And with that, I'll end. Thank you so much for listening. So many things. Many thanks, George, for this nice talk and showing how we went from the fundamental task of star galaxy separation to yeah, new and modern challenges. I think with respect to time, there is not really space for questions from the audience, but I just would like to ask you as visionary, where do you see us in 10 years? Well, um, was it Enrico Fermi who said it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future? Mm -hmm. um, maybe in nine years we'll be in a different uh, IU General Assembly and, and don't know about year after that. I think this is changing so fast. And soon I would say the evolution of technology may be beyond the scope of most people. So it, we're going to live in some really interesting times with the uh, advent of AI becoming as sophisticated as it does. It will also open all manner of epistemological challenges um, to think about. So I'll leave that as a homework to the students. <laughs> Thanks, George, for this honest question. So let's thank George Chagovsky again for this great presentation. And you know how to reach me by email, so feel free to ask any questions. Yes, if you have questions, please put them on Slack. I was checking for that constantly, but no one did so so far. David? Would also, you... Ashish, who is there, knows all of this. He's a, a co-author of the talk anyhow, and so he can answer questions in person if you want. Thanks. Mike Kyer, I also need to look at my notes. So, um, good morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our second plenary speaker, Professor Offa Lahav. Offa is the Perrin Chair of Astronomy at University College London. His research area has observational cosmology, in particular, probing and characterizing dark matter and dark energy. In fact, for more than 30 years, he has pioneered the use of machine learning methods in cosmology. His works on such topics as the estimation of photometric redshifts and the growth of cosmological structure is directly responsible for the success of large-scale surveys such as the Dark Energy Survey. He also holds leadership roles in the next generation of projects such as the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Uh, Offer studied at physics at Tel Aviv and then his PhD from the University of Cambridge where he was later a member of staff at the Institute of Astronomy at UCL. He served as the head of astrophysics, establishing cosmology as a research area there, and later serving as vice president of the Royal Astronomical Society from 2010 to 2012. Please, offer, come to the stage. Thank you very much, uh, David, for the kind introduction. Thanks also to Ashish and Kai for uh, this opportunity. Uh, we need to go back to, to the first slide. Sorry. Yeah. Good. So um, we heard yesterday a number of interesting, very interesting talks in the, in the uh, symposium, the 368 session and earlier today we just heard a great introduction by George for this topic. I'll try to focus on the deep learning side and I've allowed myself to deviate a little bit from the advertised title also include the word shallow. I'd like to contrast deep and shallow learning and to discuss some of the challenges 
of course, they are never ending. No need to uh, describe that picture there. O on the left, probably each of the images that came now from the JWST could, could, be, could generate a PhD in machine learning, uh, at least one PhD uh, project, if not many more. So this is an ongoing process, lots of data. Um, so the way I've organized this talk is to give a general introduction to the new era of uh, AI and machine learning. Then, in the blue there, to actually focus specifically on galaxy surveys and the big questions in cosmology. Uh, so, to, you know, so, so we don't just talk about machine learning out of context. We say, you know, how does it actually help us? Um, and, and then to come back to the AI and to see, to look into challenges, especially in terms of explainability, uh, detecting anomalies and so on. And I would like to bring up the issue of retraining the next generation of astronomers in data science with an example of a center for doctoral training in data intensive science we have at UCL, which I co-direct. And in fact, uh, uh, I've chosen, in terms of examples, I, I've chosen a work done by uh, students in that uh, program. Uh, again, with apologies for all the other thousands of papers uh, we, we cannot review here. Uh, but hopefully it gives you the flavor of what's going on. So again, all that is in the co context of the planning by the community for the next, uh, you know, this goes on, this is a timeline, uh, US, the US digital serv decadal survey, uh, this goes to you know, 2050 or so. And you can't read all the different uh, topics there, but essentially it's about exoplanets, multi-messengers, and uh, galaxy evolution. These are th three main themes. And really, I think I just want to show it in that context. I don't see any way of doing, achieving it without tools of machine learning, okay? So, you know, occasionally I see meetings with the title, do we need machine learning? I think that's not the question anymore. The question is how to do it reliably and in a benef beneficial form. Um, so what is AI? Uh, just to put it in, in context, at least one of the pioneers was Alan Turing. Um, the actual name AI, artificial intelligence, was coined in 1956. And, you know, in, broadly speaking, it's a branch of computer sciences and uh, to, to build smart machines. And we humble astronomers are users. Hopefully we also stimulate computer scientists to think how to uh, develop further algorithms. So there's this element of uh, hammers and nails, right? Uh, you build tools, but then you need good problems, and good problems need good tools. And there's this interplay that is going on here. And um, then come all these different buzzwords. Big data now seems to be a bit out of fashion. It's more like data science machine learning, deep learning, we'll talk more about it in a moment. Uh, we already heard yesterday and also this morning about the interplay between AI, physics, and humans. That's my version, my simple version of it, of thinking about this triangle, that there's AI in the top. And I actually, uh, you know, like this uh, terminology of augmented intelligence, rather than artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence. So, uh, we, we have this laws of physics, which probably exist even without us humans. Might be debatable, but that's probably the case. And we have the human knowledge, which has accumulated uh, over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And how, how do we actually connect them uh, in a way? And I'll, I'll show the benefits of having humans in the loop, but I'll also be a bit critical of getting, having humans in the loop. So in machine learning, there are different Approaches on the top left is an algorithm of decision trees. On the right hand is schematic neural network. Um, we talk about supervised versus unsupervised. Supervised meaning you have labels of objects and you then uh, use that to reproduce, for example, classification. And then there is this new kid in the block, uh, deep learning, to be contrasted with some would call classic, I call it shallow, but I'll say that I'll try to make the case that cello is actually quite deep. And the applications we've seen 
already yesterday, today, uh, of classification, star galaxy separation, galaxy type, supernovae, gravitational waves, their regression like photometric redshifts or properties of planets, of galaxies. One can do inverse problems and get cosmological parameters using machine learning. One can look for anomalies. And a, an area which is growing is actually generative models that you can actually uh, use, uh, for example, a uh, few small number of expensive simulations to produce many, many other simulations uh, that are cheaper to produce. So it's a whole, you know, many, many areas here, which not only data, but also simulations. Okay. Uh, well, we heard that there are some attempts uh, uh, to, to do machine learning in the early 90s uh, in, in certain corners. That's in our little corner. I was then in Cambridge. Uh, we did that, this work. It's really looking back. It's, you know, the, the first paper we had was 30 years ago. And, and we used a sample, a big data sample, 840 images from the APM. And, and we sent it to six gurus. For example, the Vaucouleur uh, uh, was one of them. Uh, the, the list is there. Uh, uh, Alan Dressler, uh, John Hukra, Sidney Vandenberg, and others. Uh, so uh, this was, if you like, a, a precursor of Galaxy Zoo, OK? 840 images and six gurus. But these are highly trained uh, class, humans who, who spent a great deal of their career classifying. And what we've shown is that you can quite easily reproduce the classification uh, using this. Those of you, some remember the T-type system of the Vaucouleur, which has 15 steps. You can reproduce it to about plus minus two on that system. And then, of course, we've extended it, applied it to other surveys, as others have done. But just to say that, you know, the, the whole concept of trying to use machines goes back now 30 years ago. Uh, but of course, with a big push in recent years. So just for those who are not practitioners, this is an example of one of the algorithms that is easy to understand. And that's using decision trees. So if you just focus on one tree, say the one on the left, you can make a decision if an object is a star or a galaxy based on the size on, on the image. So there's a free parameter which tells you if it's below that, it's a star, it's above it, it's a galaxy, for example. Uh, or, or the same way you classify flowers or trees uh, or other objects. Uh, and, but there is, of course, an element that in a particular tree, you might get a biased result. So you do, you run it over many, many trees. You allow some randomness along the way. And if algorithm, one algorithm gave you class A and another one class A, another one class B, you can do some averaging. It also gives you some statistical scatter uh, for the final class. So this is one of the most popular one because it's also easy to interpret it. Uh, so this is called um, uh, random forest. And in the wider context, I would like to think of it that we have a broader area of inference. And uh, you know, we cannot discuss any of these techniques without uh, thanking uh, Reverend uh, Bayes for this remarkable theorem. Uh, which looks so simple, but so uh, profound, uh, which is now a key in, in most of this analysis in, in cosmology and astronomy, uh, uh, that uh, in terms of A and B is the probability for the, uh, say, model parameters given the data is, is the probability for the data given the model parameters times a prior A, and there's a, a, a normalization, which is called now evidence. So I think it's very important to put it in that context to help us to understand the mystery of AI ML uh, and how to explain it, uh, how to minimize biases if the training sets are incomplete. Uh, you know, it's difficult if you, to, to classify dogs and cats if the entire training set is only made of cats. Um, there's a whole interesting question of including what physics should you include in? If you do dynamics, should you include conservation of energy or not, would you like to discover new physics? In any case, I remember when I got into this game, I came, I came across a nice article in The Economist that said that only if you know how to make money without machine learning, uh, you can m even more money with machine learning. So I still remember that and I tell my students that sentence, that don't just, you know, just download the package and stop thinking, but rather try to do it uh, in a more intuitive ways, uh, and only then 
include the rest. And indeed, we've already seen statistics today of how, no, how the number of papers goes up and up and up. Um, in this field, uh, with about 80, 90 papers per year, per year, so that means every four days, someone is writing a paper with deep learning in the title. Just think about it. So who knows how many papers will appear by the end of this conference. And a, a, a picture on the right made by one of our students is you see, hopefully you see the exponential, the x's are, you know, percentage of machine learning papers against year, and you see this uh, niece, although, you know, papers were written in, in the early 90s, it remained very much a plateau until about, about uh, uh, 10 years ago, and then a big jump, really, in the 2016 due to the deep learning. So what's going on here? Just, I know there's some people who are practitioners of this, uh, but in, in what I call shallow learning, or uh, classic learning, uh, you take an object like the one on the left, and you decide to extract features, for example, the number of circles in that object, and that's what you feed in. So you have 10, 20 parameters, you feed it in, for example, to a neural net decision tree, and it tells you whether it's a car or not a car, if you have it in a supervised way. In the deep learning, you, you skip the step of feature extraction, and you show the full image. It's all there is to it. Okay, if you've not used it, and it sounds very mysterious, all it is, in simple words, is you show the whole image, and the parts of the neural net by itself does the feature extraction. That's the idea. Now, I'd like to make the point, sometimes we're a bit dismissive to things which uh, uh, are, you know, have another step. I actually think there's a lot of wisdom that goes into feature extraction, right? All this human knowledge is there. People have to think that there's an object called a car and it's got wheels, the same way they have to think about galaxies having a bulge and a disk. So I think shallow learning is actually, not, is, is actually quite deep. And one could be a bit cynical and provocative and say maybe deep learning is a bit shallow because you don't have to think much. You just present the whole image. So this is open for discussion if people agree or disagree with me. In more detail, the wisdom of the deep learning is by putting those layers of filters or masks so this way you pick up different features. Of course, it's the whole art what filters you put there. So there's a lot of freedom with the architecture, but eventually it allows you to classify. And this is another illustration that you can do this at different levels of complexity. There are three animals, and you can see at the bottom panel, you only see short lines, which you, I cannot see an elephant there. But if you go in the hierarchy to the top, you start maybe with a bit of imagination, start seeing the imprint of an elephant. Um, so that shows you the sensitivity to what you choose as those uh, filters in, in the convolution, for example, in convolutional neural network. Okay, so up to, up to here, th the idea was really to give an overview, which hopefully sort of uh, matches or help, is helpful for those in the field, but also those who, in the audience who are, are new to this, and hopefully uh, that makes sense. Now I'd like to go to a cosmological problem. Oh, oh, before that, sorry, one more thing is to talk also about another example. I talked about deep learning. This is an example of anomaly detection. And uh, this is an example worked out by a student of mine, Constantina. And this is the famous uh, list set of uh, handwritten um, numbers. And you can use what's called variational autoencoder. You compress the information through a smaller number of uh, variables, they're called latent variables, and then explain it again. So it's, it's, if you like, it's a nonlinear ver non version of PCA. We heard about earlier principal component analysis. And the, the, the thing is, if you throw into the mix, you have, say, 99% objects which are actual digits, but you add another 1% of funny digits, like the one on the bottom left, and then you, when you recover it, you can see that you can read the letters very well, but the three uh, features at the bottom right looks very blurred, okay? So this way you can tell these are outliers. Something is wrong with them. Of course, in the context of galaxies, could be uh, just artifacts of the measurements or a whole new type of objects. So this, I think, is a very exciting field, and we are actually using it uh, now for images and spectra. Um, so now, back now to the cosmology. Okay, I promised to you, you know, we'll talk about AI, but try to connect it. So there's a whole, uh, this area of finding 
what universe we live in. And uh, this is done basically, if you can think of it as inverse problems. We measure certain things on the sky, but we have to do the analysis, take into account systematics, uh, going from what we observe to the underlying physics in a particular model. And you see our you know, old friends here, standard candles, supernovae, standard rulers, like baryonic acoustic oscillations, which appear both in galaxy distribution and the CMB. Clusters of galaxies, here is the, the beautiful uh, James Webb uh, a, a, a image we've just uh, seen uh, in recent weeks. And, and weak lensing, which I'll come back to, but if you can see, it's a bit small, but essentially, even if a galaxy is just a circle far away, the light gets bended, as Einstein has taught us, and by the time it comes to us, the, the shape is distorted. And this tiny distortion, you can turn it around, learn about the clustering along the line of sight, and also about the geometry of the universe. So this activity, especially the results from supernovae uh, uh, in, in the late 90s, has led to an amazing uh, activity with numerous projects. I think this community has been so successful that almost every project proposed got approved. Um, and uh, if not, maybe the original proposal, maybe some got merged. And this is only a subset. For example, I show for the present, we have Dark Energy Survey and DESI. Uh, then we have the project which are hopefully will start uh, running soon. Rubin LSST, Euclid, this is of course the Roman, W first. So, and you know, it's only a short list of, of all these uh, activities. Uh, these two projects are close to my, my heart. Uh, these two temples, two temples for dark energy. Uh, the, the one on the left is the Blanco in Chile, where the dark energy survey camera is, and the one on the right is, in, is the mail in Arizona. Uh, and these are international projects led, led, by, led by a US uh, laboratories, and uh, I certainly benefit enormously being part of it, in, especially DES from the early days. Uh, just after I moved from Cambridge to UCL, we got involved in our instrumentation. People actually helped to build the optical corrector. So it's very confusing. There's DES and there is DESI. So DES is a photometric survey. You look at the sky in several bands. DESI is a spectroscopic survey. DES observations are already complete, although the camera is being used for various uh, other purposes. And DESI uh, already started, and about a third of the targets have already uh, measured redshifts. Uh, so a lot is going on. I deliberately focus on projects which are here and now, uh, but of course, they all pave the way and educate us how to handle the next generation. So uh, moving quickly uh, through there, this is this set, you know, sets just examples, if you can see them on the screen, of how the data per night goes up and up and up, say from one terabyte in DES to one petabyte in SK, the number of galaxies. When I, when I did my PhD back in Cambridge, I was very lucky I had several thousands of galaxies uh, to, to do analysis of the sky. And now, you know, we already have in the bag 300 million DES galaxies and, and 12 million spectra from DESI, and the, the other service will produce billions, okay? And you can see the cost goes up, and uh, we like to tell the funding agencies that it's only, if you have a billion galaxies, it's a billion dollars, it's only one dollar per galaxy. So, you know, it's a bargain. Um, uh, if you treat it as a stamp collection, at least. Uh, and then uh, the number of scientists goes up, and that's a whole very interesting sociological aspect you know, from working just with a small group of two or three people, going all the way to uh, hundreds and now to thousands, and we are following here the footsteps of particle physics. Uh, also, all these projects take a long time. Even the ground-based projects take of the order of 20 years, not to mention space projects. So we have to think differently about all these uh, adventures. This is, again, close to my heart because I've been associated with that for nearly 20 years. Uh, I, I won't have much time to cover it, but I can refer you to that book we, we edited, which tells the story of the survey by the people who actually built it. Uh, and it even includes some ch ch chapters on anthropology and philosophy, and there's even a poem. Um, and 
this is DESI I mentioned, which aims at measuring 35 million spectra. A good news, it's already measured uh, over 12 million redshifts, which is, by the way, this number, 12 million spectra, is more than all the spectra ever collected by humanity, okay, up pre previous to DESI. So it's all fantastic. Uh, you might have heard about fire uh, on the mountain there in Arizona in June, but uh, hopefully things will come up to speed. So despite COVID and fire, uh, uh, it's all happening, and you can see this uh, nice uh, structure of the cosmic web there uh, already. Uh, now, all that is very nice. There's this cosmological model, uh, w which seems to agree with the idea that uh, only 5% of the universe is made of the, uh, baryonic matter, but then there's the um, cold dark matter, about 25% uh, and 30%, uh, remaining 70% dark energy. But as, as you know, there are problems in, in the standard model in the sense there's what's called tension between those two parameters, the Hubble constant that Planck, the cosmic micro background experiments, gives a value of 67 kilometer per second per megaparsec, while local indicators give 73. I believe there is a, a lecture uh, uh, here at this meeting about uh, tensions. Uh, this is our little contribution uh, uh, to in this review article of 40 something pages where we go through all these topics, right? Now, each of them is also a problem in data science, right? Because, you know, you, want, you just collect data, it's full of systematics, you want to make sense of it, you want to connect it to models. So, you know, all I advocate here is a more principled approach along the lines of statistics we discussed. Now, I show at the top right the, the current uh, situation of, of the model. As we said, 70% dark energy, 25% cold dark matter, so 95% we don't understand. But nevertheless, the W, which is the ratio of pressure to density, when it's exactly minus one, if you remember the textbook solution, if it's minus one, it's the cosmological constant exactly, okay? And the numbers from, at least from the DES paper from a year ago, is minus 1.03 plus minus 03. So, a question we've been asking ourselves, that's a short article with Joe Silk, we put in Nature, when to stop? Now, it doesn't mean we don't like the subject, we love the subject, but there is some wisdom that every business person knows. You have to decide when do you buy shares, when do you sell shares, when you move into something new. And it's quite an, an important problem, which in fact Alan Turing uh, considered. When do you stop, you like? Uh, 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 and, um, um, I think this is important at any level from first year PhD student all the way to funding agencies. How do you make that decision? And again, I could see the machine learning and AI as part of that activity uh, to think about it. I, by the way, short answer to that, if you have no time to read those two pages, it depends very much about what models are on the market. Is it interesting? So if someone would come up with a model that dark energy is, uh, W is minus 0.99, then it's interesting, right? Then, then, then maybe there's a room to put another billion dollar because this is you know, probably a Nobel Prize if, if it's minus 0.99, uh, if there's a model for this or especially if it's time evolution. But if it's not, some physicists would say keep, keep doing much of the same because you never know. You might find something which nobody has thought about. I think it's an interesting philosophical question uh, which is open to debate, but it's good to keep that question in mind. And then comes the question about the humans, right? So, you know, we heard yesterday, we heard this morning, it would be wonderful to get the human involved. Now, this is, I assure you, my talk is just given on a PDF file. It's not an animation. But if there is anyone in the audience who could see 12 black points all at once, do let me know. Because if so, you're a very special person. Apparently, all our brains share the same property that we actually cannot see 12 points at the same time. So, you know, it, it's a great box we have on our shoulders, and we wish to come back with all our AI results and show it, but we also have to appreciate that limitation. I, imagine if a medical doctor looks at a scan and the configuration is like this. Do you trust the classification on whether or not there is a, you know, a cancer cell there, right? 
So I want to emphasize that really the, the connection between AI and human should be kind of symbiotic, but also appreciated, also appreciating the limitation of the human brain. Um, so photometric regis mentioned earlier, uh, we got onto this game in, in just over almost 20 years ago, uh, when we heard about this problem that people, you know, look at the sky in four or five bands and try to get redshift and they get some catastrophic errors. And I thought, well, it's a problem for one afternoon. You just feed it into a neural network and you'll get the answer. So, you know, probably we were right that the neural net is very helpful and we created this package called ANZ and there's now there's later ANZ2, but uh, it was not for one afternoon. So, as you know, people are still struggling with PhotoZ. There are now a dozen or so methods uh, out there on the market, uh, tr uh, template methods, training methods, and so on. And I bet people will be standing in, in an IU 20 years from now still talking about PhotoZ, okay, because it's so crucial uh, for, for the uh, different surveys that are coming up, you know, the billion dollar projects. And, and uh, you do need good tools because that's how you tell the third dimension. Uh, but just to say that here is an example by a group, a French group, that instead of just showing five numbers per galaxy, which are the five magnitudes, uh, let's say in different bands, GRIZ, etc., they actually showed the whole image. Okay, so this is an example of CNN. And indeed, it's not very clear in that uh, scatter diagram, but if you look at the numbers, is quite a major improvement in the photos. It, you know, so if you put all this effort in getting all these billions of images, why not showing the full image? Uh, so we were stimulated by it, and with one of our uh, data-intensive science program, uh, Ben Hen, so we already graduated, we've done the same exercise, and we find an improvement uh, of about uh, a factor of two in the mean square error. So I hope I hope it's clear. I'm not taking you through all the diagrams, but essentially instead of just showing five magnitudes as shown on the left, you show the whole image. And in fact, there's even an improvement if you do both, you both the compressed version and, and the full image, of course, there's some double counting there, but in principle, you can think of some ways of removing that. So uh, I should also say together with Ben and others, we also looked at the question of scalability. So, you know, say you compare five or six algorithms of, of PhotoZ, and one is the winner, but that's only true for a particular data set, a training set or testing set. What happens as you change it? So we have a paper out there, you can look it up, where we see how the performance of algorithm changes with the number of objects. So this is a very interesting area. It's called benchmarking in certain circles of how to go from the thousand to the million to the billion. Okay. Um, you can also do more. You can use the, all the information and also get information, but stellar mass. So this is an example of uh, two objects where you can get the redshift and the stellar mass for those objects. Uh, again, led by a, a student in our program, uh, Sunil Mukesh. Uh, the, on the left is, is training by a deep field. On the right is training by a relatively shallow field. Uh, I hope you get the idea. You can extract much more information than just the redshift. Uh, and and it it's very much depends on, on the level of training. Now, this might interest you, that, that, that plot. So, uh, you know about the, the uh, Galaxy Zoo. In fact, I believe there would be a talk on, the, on this uh, on Thursday. Uh, uh, and um, this is uh, this big ensemble of galaxies, and uh, together with yet another student uh, in this program, uh, 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 Prab Bambra, the question is this explainability. Okay, so observers, or the public rather, classify them and said which galaxies have a bar. Okay, and the projector does no justice to this bar, but uh, believe me, there is a bar there, and you can then do, create what's called a sensitivity map Silency map by taking derivative of the output with respect to the input. And in fact, it does identify the bar. So it gives you an explanation, so to speak, as to what the observer has seen. And you can do the same for the bulge. And so Thank you. And you can do the same for, for the bar and the bulge and, and so on and so forth. 
and you can even measure the size of the bar, so this is this scatter diagram on the x-axis is, is a measurement uh, by this technique, on, on the x-axis is a measurement by human, and you can see good correlation. Okay, so I'm becoming quite, uh, you know, uh, excited actually about these saliency maps or heat maps they are called sometimes that tell you in a given area what's important. Otherwise, you know, just to look at it CNN blindly is a bit boring, right? You don't know why it shows it to be a bar. Here we have an explanation. Uh, and now moving to the large scale structure, which, which each galaxy is a dot, uh, what is shown on, on the middle are the sort of black dots. You see two, two projections there. One is of a, a simulation that looks like the standard model, Lambda CDM. The one one is, is a funny one. It's the Levy flight uh, distribution. You can see by eye, any child can tell you that they're very different. But nevertheless, when you do a correlation function, it is the same. So the two point for correlation function, which is why it uses, is not discriminatory. So instead we used here by another student, uh, work by another student, Krish, Krishna Naidu, uh, this minimum spanning tree, which actually, you know, you, you, you look at the dots, you connect them by lines, it's some kind of graph theory, and then you can do statistics, and there are four statistics, and now you can see that the blue and green look very different from each other, so it's much more discriminatory. And this is sort of halfway towards this kind of deep learning, okay, but here's a bit more explanation. So as you can see, we do things slowly to understand them before just doing the black box. And uh, speeding up a bit, this is about uh, using these weak lensing techniques. You've seen the, the plot on the left earlier. You can use the distortion of the images to undo it and discover the dark matter. There was a technique from 30 years ago by Kaiser and Squires. You can also use the good old Wiener filter, but here is a technique using deep learning by training on hundreds of thousands of simu simulations and then show the right universe and top right is the result from the dark energy survey uh, and, and the bottom is a simulation. So uh, you can use that. This has led to an even better map uh, that a year ago got publicity. It made it to the news uh, on the BBC a television work laid by another former student, Nile Jeffrey, and it even made it to private eye, those of you who are familiar with the British uh, uh, media. Uh, and uh, it says, you cannot read it, it says in private eye, it says, it's our most comprehensive dark matter map yet. So, you know, that's uh, as far as you go, just publicity. Um, and you can look at, at regions on the sky, this is the current postdoc, Ellen Hung, and you can really see peaks and voids in this mass map, which comes from kind of AI-inspired way. And you can also look, see that the galaxy distribution more or less follows what you see in the dark matter. You know, now we have to pause for a minute and just appreciate the people who build the instruments. I know it because the, you know, part of it was built in, in our basement. And you just think of all the you know, problems in, the, uh, in terms of um, a, aligning and, and polishing lenses to get to the point that you can actually get measure the distortion of these tiny galaxies, get a ma dark matter map and then compare it with the galaxy distribution and see correspondence, you know, we have to appreciate that. It, it's not trivial at all. And, uh, and then, uh, I'm almost, almost there, uh, the, one can take another step and get cosmological parameters. So this is from a group in Zurich. And what they do is they feed in lots and lots of simulations into some sort of CNN, and they get out of it the cosmological parameters, right? So instead of the traditional way that you write a likelihood function and so on, you just show many, many images and you say, and they have different cos cosmological parameters, and you say, okay, which universe is, is, is the best fit universe? And then they've done something similar to what we have done uh, on the galaxy image of looking at sensitivity map. So which regions in the sky actually give you that signal? So there is something for those of you who, who work on weak lensing, there is a, a so-called intrinsic alignment effect. So this is, if you take the derivative of this intrinsic alignment with respect 
to the projected mass, you can identify regions, that's in the central plot where you see three yellow arrows, uh, you can identify uh, those regions as, as those that give you the most information about uh, this parameter. Okay, so I hope you get the idea. It's, it's all about trying to get a better and better uh, explain, explainability. And very quickly, I want just, you know, we talked a lot about yesterday and, and today, and we'll hear more about Galaxy Zoo and other exercises of classification, but I would like to say that this machine learning can also be very useful for dynamics. You know, we still don't know what's the mass of the Milky Way and Andromeda, right? Uh, we, uh, but we know they're falling towards each other. One day will collide. And there, there have been a methods, the simplest of them is an analytic one called timing argument, and then some other methods. Uh, and we've taken the machine learning approach to actually constrain their mass, again, by showing a computer two million Milky Way Andromeda lookalike, okay? And we use a technique likelihood free inference, which means using knowledge about how this system behaves using two million objects and then showing the one, the one universe, right? The, the, the real Andromeda Milky Way, the infall velocity and the separation. And here's a number uh, uh, to take home from that uh, activity uh, for the two, two masses. Okay, so I hope, you know, I hope you get uh, the idea that you can really make a very interesting comparison between simulations and data using artificial uh, intelligence methods. And in the last minute, last minute, uh, just to say something about training, again, there were some comments made earlier by George about it uh, and others. Yes, we have to train the students in a way D different than the way we were trained, okay? It's very different when you work in your PhD, like myself, on thousands of objects where you have to deal with billions. And we have to catch up with all the literature and computer science and other things. So luckily, uh, the Research Council in the UK, STFC, had that vision, and we won a competition, a bid, five years ago to start this uh, center. Uh, other seven universities got got uh, support as well, and we just got, there was another bid, uh, which we, we, we luckily won alongside other four other places, and we can now carry it on until 2028. So what it is, we have, it's a special PhD program with 10 students per year, approximately, uh, 10 have already graduated, those from the first year, and in the four year of the program, the students do over three, three and a half years, they do actual, an actual project in astronomy or particle physics, but they also spend six months in the industry. And they work on completely different problems, but of course with machine learning methodology. So this has been going very well. The, 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 the idea is really to, to offer people dual careers so they can uh, later choose what direction they wish to take. But I have to say, lots of cross-fertilization you know, a student of mine, I mentioned an example, went to work in a company, she worked on anomalies, and then she came back and were using those techniques uh, to, do, to, to search for anomalies in DESI data, for example. Uh, and uh, these are, I was fortunate to supervise five of the 53 uh, in that program. Uh, you can see names of different companies uh, covering the public sector, government, and so on. And also, uh, especially speaking here at the uh, International Astronomical Union meeting where it's a lot about, as we heard yesterday on this stage, it's a lot about crosstalk and, and increasing the circle and making wider participation. We actually received a grant from, uh, again, from the British government uh, to support activity. They have similar grants, for example, for SK in South Africa, and we applied and received money to do it with Jordan. And uh, although we had to wait for <laughs> two years uh, until they could travel. Uh, they finally came uh, three weeks ago to, to London and we had a fantastic summer school and here we're also being hosted in the embassy by the Jordan ambassador to, to the UK. And you know, I, I like to think of, of this as data science a bit like music. It, it's, a, it's a universal language and I think it can bring young people together 
you know, and maybe help, help with peace in the world without, without sound, sounding uh, uh, too pretentious here. And maybe we can extend it across the Middle East and other regions. Uh, and finally, that's it, David, just to say that uh, you know, astronomy is definitely going industrial revolution with all these uh, projects, but we have challenges there uh, on, on really understanding the deep learning uh, and interpreting it and how to incorporate physics or get new physics and how to upscale it to the exascale. And finally, it's a great way to train uh, PhD students and postdocs well beyond academia. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that marvelous talk. Are there any questions from the audience? No immediate questions. So I'm going to uh, ask a question myself. I think that, that one thing I was, uh, that really impressed me was that we're still using machine learning to try and find out something fundamental about the nature of, of the universe, about the nature of cold dark matter and of the cosmological constant or whatever the dark energy is. I might suggest that a progress is a tripod of uh, observational technology, uh, theoretical understanding, and then analysis methods such as machine learning. Which of these three do you feel is currently lagging in terms of the progress that we're making? I mean, we saw the beautiful results from DESI, and we've heard a lot about these, these fantastic machine learning methods which are now being applied. Would you, would you like to comment on which area perhaps needs more, more work? Well, the trivial answer is I think each of them needs some help, but, but to, be, to be, as your, your question is quite targeted, uh, let me say on the observational side, I think understanding systematics is, is the big thing, right? So you see this tension in the Hubble constant, you know, should you sleep, do sleep over this overnight? Uh, maybe just something is not quite right in, in one of the probes. Maybe it's something deeper, we really, we really don't know. But I would say that machine learning can also help with that. Okay, and you can do what's called forward modeling and take, take a, a simulation which is kind of clean and pure and degrade it to add all the observational effects. And then also ask yourself, have, have you forgotten something? Is something missing? So I, I could see, you know, I'm sort of combining, you know, I think systematics is a big issue and maybe machine learning can help that. Of course, machine learning can help a lot comparing simulations with data, as I've just showed you. You show two million pairs of Milky Way Andromeda, and then you try to draw it for us. About theory, I find that in a somewhat different category. We, you know, there are attempts, of course, to do this you know, symbolic learning and, and you know, show data, but I don't know. I'm, maybe I'm a bit conservative. Do you think, imagine general relativity was not there. Would, would machine learning discover general activity. So it's an interesting exercise maybe to do that. But I think we still need some creativity there, and maybe the human mind is great there, to tell us what does it all mean. Thank you. I completely agree. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? If not, uh, thank, we should thank Professor Mahav again. Thank you. Thank you.